صلى من على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد There is one ayah of the Quran that you may have heard in your tarawih prayer being recited and as a part of today's khatira I wanted to spend a few moments reflecting over that particular ayah The context or the backdrop to that ayah is very interesting I'll share the narration with you There was a person who lived during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam His name was Uqba bin Abi Mu'it a prominent enemy of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam someone who spoke out against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but this was towards the latter part of his life in the earlier part of his life he was quite the sympathizer had a lot of love and respect for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam until the point that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him extra attention and extra love he would listen to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the prophet would advise the companions one day he came back from a trip and it was a business trip his tijara his business was successful on the caravan so in order to celebrate the success in his business he invited the people of makkah mukarramah together for a dinner Amongst the people invited was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam attended the gathering. They had a good night together. When it came time to eat food, he approached the Prophet and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "That lead us in dinner. Join us." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used that opportunity to nudge him in a direction that he was already walking towards. He was already listening to the prophet he was already attentive his heart was changing the prophet noticed all of this so the prophet took that opportunity and said to him i will not eat until you accept islam he put him in the hot seat by the way you don't do this everywhere you go like i'm not going to eat my panera bread unless you accept islam because that person is going to say i don't care but because this person had that relationship with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gave it some thought and he realized that han al awan like the time was here and he accepted islam now the next day around what happened was he went back to makka he met his friends the next day abu jahl who was one of his closest friends met him and abu jahl said to him i heard that you've been sitting with muhammad and his companions and you've become muslim so uqba responded back by saying yes it's true i have become muslim Abu Jahl said to him then you have no place with us either you're from them either you're from us you can't be from both this put Uqba in a very tough position and i want you to put yourself in this position and not just judge him right off the bat right because i want you to put yourself there and ask yourself what decision would you make on one side he has the muhammad he has the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam inviting him towards jannah which he knows intellectually is the right message He's given his heart to it which means he accepts it. On the other hand he has Abu Jahl and Co who are saying that even though our message may not be intellectually coherent but our companionship is what you crave for and you can't have both. There was a scholar from the subcontinent by the name of Sheikh Ashraf Ali Thani rahimahullah ta'ala. He said something very beautiful. He said that if you study people and you study societies What you'll learn is generally people fall into one of four categories when it comes to their relationship with their religion. Most people will fall into one of four categories. Deen mizaji, deen riwaji, deen shar'i, deen haqiqi. Either their religion, their practice with their religion, their interaction with their religion is based on mizaj. Mizaj means their personality. So where whatever they want whatever their personality calls them towards if religion agrees with that they'll take it but the moment religion and personality clash what side are they going to take their personality what their nafs wants what their desires wants they're not interested in knowing what sharia is 
These people aren't interested in the fatwa, they're not interested in Quran, they're not interested in hadith. For them, what my heart says, my religion is all my heart. Then the second, and this is interesting because believe it or not, many of us fall into this category unknowingly. There was a father who came to me and said, my son wants to marry somebody and we're not happy with that person. Can you please tell our son how important it is for him to have his father's dua for this marriage? So I said, fair point. I sat with the son and I said, well, it is true. Make a little compromise, listen to your parents. Maybe Allah will give you something better in life. He said, Sheikh, but this girl has everything. I said, I know, but your father's not buying it. So you have to make a decision. And I'm not gonna make it for you, but I am gonna tell you that your parents, you know, respect them and honor them. They've given their life to you. Just be considerate of what your father wants. He said, okay. By the way, I didn't force him to make the decision. He went and he chose to go with what his father said. After he made that decision, he kind of connected himself to the masjid, became a regular attendee, you know, more punctual in his religion. A few months later, the same father brought his son to me again. But this time, believe it or not, the father came with the son not because he had a complaint, but because the son had a complaint. He said, Shaykh, a few, a few months back, my dad brought me to you because I wasn't practicing Islam by not taking his barakah. Now my father found me someone to marry. I agreed, but he's telling me he wants dancing and music in the wedding. And I told him that, Dad, the Islam that you called me to three months ago says that this is not allowed. And the father says to me, Deko mera beta molvi ban gaya. You made my son into a scholar now. It's, it's extremist. We want Islam in our life, but not this version of Islam. We want the Islam that matches what we want. You guys understand that? This is the personality, Deen Mizaji. The second is what he calls Deen Riwaji. And by the way, your kids are going to smell it out like no tomorrow. Parents, be careful of this because our preaching of Islam to our kids is usually this. We tell them to do what we want them to do and the second they start doing things that are beyond what we want them to do but still is under the banner of that same religion, we get offended by that. And believe it or not, your kids are going to smell it from miles away. And then don't ask them why they don't have loyalty in their religion or to you as a parent. The second is what he calls Deen Riwaji. This is a practice of religion that is more cultural. And again, has nothing... This is, as long as culture agrees, as long as religion agrees with my culture, I'll take it. But the second the two co contradict one another, which one is this person going to side with? Culture. And you can go back to weddings and you'll find so many examples of this. Or people that say they're religious, the second their, their marriages come and culturally something is demanded or expected of them, no matter how, beard that, how big that beard is, even if it wraps around your waist five times, you're gonna find that guy doing bagra. He's gonna be dancing away. And I'm telling you, you guys are laughing, ha ha. I've seen there, been there, done it. You know? Auntie, mashallah, does the Quran halaqa. Brother, mashallah, is the, you know, the, does hadith, reads hadith. But when his kids or their grandkids are getting married, all the hadith has gone out the window, all the Quran has gone out the window. And if you approach them and say, aren't you the advocates, aren't you the spokespeople for Islam and the community? They say, well, this is cultural, Shaykh. Religion has nothing to do with, with Islam. This is, what is it? Cultural. Allahu Akbar. I was once called by a friend of mine. We memorized the Quran together when we were kids. Then after that, he didn't pursue any further Islamic knowledge. He kind of ended it there. He got married in a Muslim country. And he called me from that country. I saw a foreign number and those days, back in the day, you'd get, called, you'd get charged for incoming calls. You guys remember those days? No, yes? So I said, there's a foreign number calling me. Me being Mehman, I'm not answering that call. I'm not paying for someone else's call. Foreign call. He called me a few times and I said, Chala, I'll answer the call quickly and I'll get it done within one minute. So I said, Salaam Alaikum. I said, Wa Alaikum Salaam. He goes, Hussein. I said, yes. Then he said his name. I don't want to say his name. He said, oh, this is me. I was like, oh, wow. What's going on? He said, I, ha I got married, mashallah, and I have a very big problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, the problem is that I got married, and in our culture, when the bride, and gr when the bride walks out of the hall, they carry a Quran over her head. And they're told that as long as this Quran remains with you, Allah's shade and mercy will remain with you. Now, the problem is, the Qur'an they carried over my wife's head was so big that four people were carrying it. It doesn't fit into my suitcase. 
If I leave this country and come back to America without the Qur'an, will my marriage last or not? What is the fatwa? You just can't make this stuff up, guys. You just can't make it up. deen riwaji a cultural practice of religion. Then he says the third group of people, he calls them deen shar'i These are people who practice their faith based off of legality. They're interested in the fatwa. What is haram and what's fard? Tell me that, don't tell me anything else in between. Whatever is fard, I'll do it. Whatever is haram, I'll stay away from it. In between, makru, halal, mashallah. Sunnah, forget it, who cares? And unfortunately, many of us fall into this category too. He says, then comes the highest form of practicing religion, Shaykh Ashraf Ali, rahimahullah. And that is what he calls deen haqiqi, the true practice of Islam. And this true practice of Islam is a pursuit of imitating the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where I'm not necessarily interested in what's halal and haram and fard and that's a fard and, halal and, and, and haram is not a discussion I'm necessarily interested in. I'm more interested in what's the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually do this thing? And unfortunately, many of us get caught in the crossfire and we don't know where our own place is with our religion. And it's this broken half practice of Islam that rather than being a form of da'wah or service to yourself, ends up becoming a disservice to humanity. When people have broken practices of Islam. I sat with a young man yesterday who came to visit me. His relatives called me and they said to me that, you know, there's a young person in our family who is contemplating to leave Islam. The parents don't know what to do. He spoke to an imam, the imam gave him answers, he wasn't satisfied, he wants to come and speak with you. So I said, look, if you spoke to one imam, I don't know, I don't have any voodoo that I'm gonna help the guy, but if he wants to come and sit, he can come, no problem. He came to the Carrollton community, I sat with him. And it was so interesting because every cultural practice that you can think of was a part of his life, and it was a constant misrepresentation of Islam that literally pushed this guy out of Islam. You guys understand that? It was this constant misrepresentation of Islam. Constant, happening again and again and again, which just pushed him right out of Islam. And he's telling me that he was interested in Christianity. And I said, what? Are you kidding me? Like, when you study a religion, when I study religion, there are two things that matter to me, authenticity and practicality. Right? And I don't find a religion more authentic than Islam, neither do I find any religion that's more practical than, than Islam. Right? And any form of another religion that seems to be practical, the truth is that those rulings aren't authentic from their sources. These are later on, if you want to call it, as we'd say, bid'at, within those religions. If you trace rulings back in other religions, and I said this, there, there is no religion that I see, and I want you to challenge me. He said, I've talked to many Imams and they haven't been able to satisfy me. I said, well, now you're going to get in the ring with Muhammad Ali. Throw it at me. Like, you've talked to people. Not every person is an Imam. Some people are good speakers and some people, they've studied a little bit. This isn't a matter of arrogance. This is just sometimes it's important to let our youth know that they need to know the difference between the MSA Khatib and someone who's actually studied Islam. Fahimtum, you guys understand that? This is an important distinction, actually. So, unfortunately, this person, he was at a very messed up state. And I, I say this because until we don't find our practice with Islam and our loyalty with our religion, it's very hard for us to find ourselves and our service of this deen. Someone asked Hassan al-Basri that I have two questions. I'm going to ask you these questions, but don't be quick at answering them. I'll come back to you in two, three days for the answer. Hassan al-Basri was Hassan al-Basri. For those of you who don't know, he was given that name by Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh. He was nursed by the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, that's Hassan al-Basri by the way, okay? So he said to Hassan al-Basri, I'm gonna ask you a question, but I'll come back for the answer in two, three days. Hassan al-Basri said, what's your question? He said, what is Islam and who are Muslims? Who are Muslims and what is Islam? So Hassan al-Basri said, I don't need three days for the answer. If you want the answer now, you can take it now. He said, what's the answer? He said, Islam is in the books, Muslims are in the graves. Otherwise, if you're looking for it in me or you or in people, that doesn't exist anymore. And he's saying this at a time, Hassan al-Basri is a tabi'i by consensus. 
What did I say? He's a tabi. I just said he was named by who? Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. He narrates regularly from Ali radiallahu anhu. Most of his marasil, he skips Ali radiallahu anhu's name for those of you who understand that. But nonetheless, he's a tabi. And he's saying this regarding his time. That the practice of Islam is gone. So coming back to the original narration that I started off with, this person had to make a very tough choice. And that choice was between something he knew was the truth and companionship, cultural pressure, peer pressure. Which one does he choose? Unfortunately, he made the wrong decision. After accepting Islam at the hands of the Prophet and temporarily holding the title of being a Sahabi of the Prophet wasallam, as my teacher used to say, almost having one foot in Jannah, Almost there. It just didn't touch the ground. It was right there. He then said to Abu Jahl, I will take your companionship over his any day. Tell me what do I need to do? Abu Jahl said, you will need to go to his face publicly and in front of everyone, say to his face that you do not believe him. And not only that, according to one narration, he actually said to him, go and spit on his face. Uqba bin Abi Mu'eet, the unfortunate man, after he had everything, he had Jannah in the back, he was just about to fall into the end zone. And right then, what happened? He came back to the Prophet And according to the narrations, one narration, he said to the Prophet openly, بَلْ أَنْتَ مُذَمَّمَا He cursed the Prophet publicly. And in one narration, he spat on the Prophet. And Another narration states that the angel stopped that spit and pushed it back on his face, which caused a burn on his face. And regarding this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some ayat in the Quran. And I wanted to share those ayat today with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا لَقَدْ أَظَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا On that day you will see, on that day meanings, means Qiyamah. On that day you will see the oppressor, يَعَظُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ Biting on his fingers out of regret and remorse. Because he will know on the day of judgment he made the wrong decision. And on the day of judgment he will say, يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا Only if I kept the messenger as my friend. Only if I kept my path with him. يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا Only if I didn't make so-and-so person my friend. Who is that so-and-so person? Abu Jahl. Right? Because Abu Jahl was the one who misguided him. لَقَدْ أَظَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي Because he misguided me after I was guided. <laughs> I lost my guidance after I had it all. Now the reason why I shared this ayah before you, for this qiyam, is because in this Ramadan, tell me you haven't gained a lot. All this fasting, tell me you haven't felt the spiritual change, the tilawah of the Qur'an, the qiyam. I'm telling you, some of you are at a point right now spiritually, you don't even know it, that if you just pushed yourself a little more, your eyes would cry out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of you are so close right now, tomorrow's the 27th night, trust me, if you just pushed yourself a little bit, you would fall into sajda alone in your room and you'd cry in front of Allah, cry and cry and cry. Which is the heights of spirituality, by the way, when a person has the ability to cry in front of Allah. I've been doing qiyams for the past, past few days, and believe it or not, that's all I've been talking about. Today I said, you know what, we'll take another ayah and discuss something else. Otherwise, for the past few days, all I've been saying to the congregations that I've spoken to is, my dear friends, before Ramadan ends, try to find a moment where you raise your hands and cry in front of Allah. That's the haq of your eye, that you let it live for the sake of Allah. And your eye is a testimony of what your heart carries. If you have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if you can really tap into that love, trust me, you'll reach there. So spiritually, you've come so far. We've accomplished so much. People who are struggling to pray a single salah are now punctual in praying Fajr salah. Yes or no? Yes or no, guys? It's true. That's the miracle of Ramadan. But each and every one of us, unfortunately, has an Abu Jahl in our life. There is an Abu Jahl with us. And that Abu Jahl is waiting. And that Abu Jahl is not happy. 
Spiritually, how much ever we grow, that Abu Jahal wants to constantly yank us back down. Constantly yank us back down. When I say Abu Jahal, I'm not talking about a person in particular. Even though for some of us it may be a person, it may be an influence. For me, that Abu Jahal is more sometimes your Netflix, your habits. Sometimes Abu Jahal isn't another person, it's a part of you that keeps dragging you back down after you've accomplished so much. And the question is, after you've come so far, is it really worth losing it all? What if we don't make it to another Ramadan? What if Allah doesn't allow the hearts to feel what they feel today? What if Allah doesn't give us the honor or the opportunity to do one more sajda in our life? I'll share one story with you, then I'll close. I went for Umrah some years back in the month of Ramadan. In my life, I've only been for Umrah and Ramadan twice. Once was my parents, my mother and father took me. Right before I started studying, my parents took me to the Haram and then they sent me to study from there. And the second was a few years back, I went for Umrah in the month of Ramadan. On my second trip, my recent trip, a few years back, I remember one day I was there, we were in Medina Munawwara. I went alone. I didn't, have, I didn't go with any group or anything. I just went alone, no family. I was in Medina Munawwara and I got to the Haram, the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a little late. And it was Maghrib time. The Adhan was just about to start. And there, was, there were large crowds being pushed into the mosque and I somehow got in too. My elbows were pinned to my shoulder and the Adhan started. And I was standing and I didn't know where to even get a date from. I couldn't even reach out to get a date. I was so constrained. So while I was standing there and the Adhan started and everyone was breaking their fast in the Prophet's mosque, there was a person, he kind of slid a date into my right hand. Like there was nothing there and then there was something there. And I was like, whoa, that's great. So I took the date and I had it. And then I thought to myself, I wonder who that guy was. So I can say Jazakallah to him. So I turned to my right and it was this guy lying on a stretcher. Just lying there. He was on a stretcher and he gave me the date. He smiled at me. I saw this guy and I was starstruck. Have you guys ever been starstruck by the way? Like you meet someone that you never thought you'd meet? I was starstruck. Because this guy, I saw a video of him on YouTube a few years back, which went viral, and I'm sure many of you guys have probably seen this video. And that YouTube video that I saw, believe it or not, I was crying when I watched that video. And this guy was sitting next to me. And I, I didn't think that would happen in Medina Munawwara. So I said, okay, let's pray salah. After salah, I'll talk to him. We paid Maghrib salah together, side by side. After Maghrib, I sat down with him and I said to him, he lived in Jeddah. So I said to him, wow, I just want you to know that I'm a big fan. I saw your interview on YouTube and it really had me crying. It was really awesome. But just for the sake of barakah, can you share the story that you shared there with me directly? It'll make me really happy. How did you reach this stretcher? And then there were some questions that I wanted to ask him. So he said, well, a group of our friends, the young guy, he's African. He said, a group of our friends, we went swimming one day. I dived into the pool. My head hit the ground, unfortunately. I was paralyzed. And here I am on the stretcher. And on that TV show, the uh, host asked him a question. And this man was on the... Do, have any, any of you guys seen this video, by the way? Yes, have you, you've seen it? That brother, he was next to me. He was... Uh, the host, there was a, a panel of young people sitting there. The host asked him, do you have any desires in your life you wish you can fulfill? And he started off by saying, Al-Amani. You ask about my dreams. He said, I have three things I wish I can fulfill. The first thing he said, Allahu Akbar. An asjuda lillahi sajda. I wish I can make one more sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people on the panel started crying. <clears throat> he said to the people, why are you crying today? When I was healthy, you never came and cried and asked me to do sajda then. And now when you see me in my misery, you're talking about crying? And he read the ayah of Surah Ma'arij. يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ on the day of judgment, people will be invited to prostrate in front of Allah and they won't have the ability. Why? Because when they were alive, they were invited to sajda and they never came to sajda once. They were too busy for sajda. Who had time for Allah? Why do I need Allah in my life? 
What has Allah done for me anyway? He said the second thing, I wish I could turn the pages of the Quran one more time. But my hands no longer have that ability either. And he said the third thing, I wish it was a day of Eid. I would get dressed up and go for Salah and come back home and open the door and my mother would stand in front of me and I could hug her one more time. But I've lost that ability too. And I think of that video quite regularly by the way. I don't know, I'm sure some of you guys will enjoy watching it. I don't know what you would even search to find it, but if you just put some search words together, you might come across it. But I think of that video all the time because I think to myself, SubhanAllah, Allah has given me the opportunity to do at least two of those three things. Until recent, I had the opportunity to do all three things until my mother was alive. And we never took benefit of it. What does a sajda mean to me? What does it mean to you? It's nothing. It's just something I do because I have to do. When the sajda was actually a testimony of love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was our hand on our heart saying, Ya Allah, not only is my heart gift to you, but my forehead is for you too. Sajda ya ishko to ibadat mein maza aata hai. Khali sajdo mein to dunya basa karti hai. Log kehte hai ke farz ada karna hai. Aisa lagta hai ke koi qarz ada karna hai. Tere sajde tujhe kafir na kar de aqbal. Tu jukta hai kahi aur, sochta hai kahi aur. I mean, our sajda was a testimony of love to Allah. That, Ya Allah, here I've come to you with the world behind. I'm not going to look at them. The only thing I can look at is the ground and that's all I'm worth. The closest you were to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when you put that forehead on the ground, humbling yourself in front of Allah, saying out loud to yourself, Subhan Rabbi al-A'la. Here I am nothing and Allah is the greatest. Here I am nothing, Allah is the greatest. Khair, I know you guys came for Qiyam not to sit here and listen to me. So I close off asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us those moments of Ramadan, the moments of the awliya and salihin, the moments of the anbiya and sahaba, and that this Ramadan is something meaningful for us, and that this Ramadan is an opportunity that we take that axe of Ibrahim alayhi salam and behead that Abu Jahl within us that keeps stopping us from returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Accept this Ramadan, our ibadah, and whatever remains of it. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi jma'in. 